Our scripture for today comes out of 1 Samuel. If you don't have a Bible with you, it's going to be up here on the screen. If you do have a Bible, please go ahead and use it. 1 Samuel chapter 24. I'm going to begin in verse 1, and I'm going to read through verse 7. We could go on to verse 11, but we'll just read up through verse 11. So, after Saul returned from fighting the Philistines, he was told that David had gone into the wilderness of En Gedi. So Saul chose 3,000 elite troops from all Israel and went to search for David and his men near the rocks of the wild goats. At the place where the road passes some sheepfold, Saul went into a cave to relieve himself. But as it happened, David and his men were hiding further back in that very cave. Now is your opportunity, David's men whispered to him. Today the Lord is telling you, I will certainly put your enemy into your power to do with as you wish. So David crept forward and cut off a piece of the hem of Saul's robe. But then David's conscience began bothering him because he had cut Saul's robe. The Lord knows I shouldn't have done that to my Lord, the king, he said to his men. The Lord forbid that I should do this to my Lord, the king, and attack the Lord's anointed one. For the Lord himself has chosen him. So David restrained his men and did not let them kill Saul. After Saul had left the cave and gone his way, when reversed, David came out and shouted after him, My Lord the King. And when Saul looked around, David bowed low before him. Join me again in a word of prayer. Father, as we read these verses, help us to truly understand what was going on that day and how that applies to us. Because, Father, I believe that it does. Even though it happened so long ago, there are things within this story, Father, that can touch our lives and move us forward in our walk and our growth with you. So I ask certainly for you to be present here today in such a way that, God, we know that it is you speak and not me. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, but like I said, that last one had to have been Dan, okay? Um, and, and I do, where, where, where'd he go? Is he hiding from me? There he is, right? He's, he's got his head bowed low. I think he's trying to hide from me. Um, no, I, I, I appreciate that. But did you see the looks on these people's faces? Have you ever had a look like that on your face? A look of shock, bewilderment, puzzlement. Did your cat or dog ever give one of those expressions? Wondering what in the heck is going on. You know, it's an amazing thing about the life of David. David is referred to as a man after God's own heart. And yet, if you read the story, all of the story, every reference there is in the Bible to David, you'll find out David messed up his life pretty big. He messed up his family pretty bad. And yet, he was still called a man after God's own heart. If there's anything we can take away from that, the simplest thing is basically this, is it doesn't make any difference how bad I mess up. God still loves me enough to look at me and say that I'm a man after his own heart. If I continue to seek him, if I continue to look for him, if I sit still long enough and am quiet long enough, I may hear him. But when you consider the life of David... I find some of these things puzzling, just like these people that were on the screen. And the particular story that we read here in the scripture is also a puzzling one. The title of my message basically is an unlikely kind of transformation. An unlikely kind of transformation. We've been in this thing about transformation now for a couple of months. And I got to reading this when we were talking about what we were going to do for this particular month. This, partic- this verse, this section of scripture just jumped out at me in, you know, in my mind. And so, okay, Lord, I'll go with that. And I thought it was a strange one. And I came across some words and some teachings about it and some other people's opinions. And, you know, I thought to myself, well, okay, that's, that's all well and good. But, you know, this is rather strange. This, this doesn't speak to transformation the way we normally think of transformation. When we think of transformation, we think of that butterfly that started out as the caterpillar and turned into this beautiful thing that flies around. But there's another kind of transformation, and we'll get to that in here, here in just a minute, that, that I want to try to emphasize. I find it strange, but yet I think it's extremely, extremely important. 
one thing that you have going on in your life, whether you call yourself a believer or not, whether you think you're just a searcher, or maybe you think you're a Christian, you're a church member, it doesn't make any difference where you stand in your relationship with God at this particular moment. There's one thing that you do. In looking for God and trying to understand God, one question you will always ask is this. What does God want from me? What does he want me to do? Another thing, the way you might put that is, what is God's will for my life? Have you heard that one? I hear that one all the time. That's a real churchy word, uh, as some people put it. What is God's will for my life? One individual said, if you're asking that particular question, you're asking the wrong question. It's not what is God's will for my life that we should be asking. It's just simply what is God's will? And it's all contained right here. Now, the application of God's will is going to be a little bit different for your life than it is for mine. That's true. But it's still God's will. There are things God wants all of us to do and not to do. In the Great Commission, he says, All authority is given unto me. Therefore, go, or as you're going. So God's will for every believer is to reach out for other people, to reach out to other individuals who do not yet necessarily know God, may be searching for and may believe that there is a God. But it's up to us, in that sense, we are to go. But then there are times we're told to be still and know that I am God, where we're not to do anything, but simply wait on the Lord. Wait for Him to strengthen us, to encourage us, to teach us, to give us the direction we're supposed to go. I find it amazing in the scripture um, that oftentimes there, there's one particular individual that when he prayed to God about what God would have him to do, it took him four months to get an answer. Four months. I have a hard time waiting four days, four hours, four minutes. Tell me now. <laughs> But God sometimes makes us wait. Look at the whole nation of Israel when they were in bondage to Egypt. How long did they have to wait before God finally sent their deliverer through Moses? Over 430 years. Now, all these individuals, I'm sure, weren't necessarily praying because that's just the nature of the human creature. But there were a lot of people in all of these successive generations of people that were praying for God's deliverance. And God finally did deliver at the right time, in the right place, and in the right way. When Jesus came into the world, he came at the right time, he came at the right place, and in the right way. We can have him coming all kinds of different ways, and it's still not going to be the right way, nor the right time or right place. But when it was the right time, and that's the way it works in our lives, too. Sometimes God is not going to do something in our life that we may be asking him to do until it's the right time. And that may not be the time that we think it is. Then it may not be the time that someone else wishes it was for us. God has his plan and purpose. He doesn't ask for my permission. He doesn't ask for my input. But he has a plan. And he had a plan with David as well. Remember now, David started out as a little shepherd little shepherd boy. That doesn't mean he was a little weakly, because if you remember the story of David, David talks about the idea that he not only killed a lion, but he killed a bear, with his, basically with his bare hands. And think about the story of Goliath. Now here's all these army, army men, and there's this one big old dude, clumsy, ugly, smelly, hadn't taken a bath in four years, He could smell him across the valley. But he was criticizing the God of Israel. And the nation of Israel was doing nothing about it. They were shivering and shaking. And David saw this. And basically he chastised the army. Why are you letting them do this? And here's this one little young man who said, I'll take care of it. And he went out on behalf of King Saul. And with his sling killed this individual with with one stone. David became commander of the armies. We see David moving up the ranks. We see David being given 
in marriage one of Saul's daughters. We see Saul getting very jealous of David because the people were praising the acts of David more than those of Saul. David has killed his tens of thousands while Saul has killed his thousands. And that angered Saul. So much that David now is living his life, not once, not twice, but probably three, four, and who knows how many other times, in fear of his very life. He was living in the king's court, playing the harp, trying to soothe the nerves of Saul. And Saul, it says this this spirit came upon him, and he threw the spear at David, nearly killing him. He chased David all over the country. He'd hear, he'd hear where he was at at this particular point, and by the time he'd get there, he'd be gone. Someone would come and warn David. David became best friends with Saul's own son, and yet Saul sought to use that relationship against David. You ever feel like that sometimes? That someone is against you even though you haven't done anything wrong at all? Someone else may be applauding your efforts, but you certainly didn't start out to do that. But someone else in a position of authority over you is upset because you're getting the glory and not them. Or maybe your life is being made miserable by somebody, much like David was basically, he, he, he became a fugitive. He did nothing wrong. Oftentimes that's the way it is. We, we do have experiences like that. It can come from who knows what sources in our life. It can come from our our uh, place of employment. It can come from our neighborhood. It can come, it can come from a lot of different places. When we want to know God's will, and David wanted to know God's will, if we look at David, I came away with the conclusion, re- reading the first portion of uh, 1 Samuel about David, that David seemed to know without a doubt what God's will was. He there didn't seem to be any doubt, any question about what God wanted for him to do. In fact, remember, when, da- when, when David was anointed as king, he had no questions about it as far as we know. He didn't resist it as far as we know. And he accepted it. However, there was one problem with that. Don't you think he'd want to take, uh, assume the office right away? Kind of like in our own, little, our own political arena. We have elections, actually, every two years, not every four years, but we have elections every two years. And when the election is over, there's a certain amount of gap time before that individual will then take over uh, the reins of the individual they defeated. But it's a short amount of time. Now, here we have Saul and David, and it was a much longer time than just a few months. Time after time after time, Saul sought to kill him. David wouldn't do anything to fight back. He basically ran. He made friends with people. It got so bad that even if David talked to certain people, that was reported back to Saul, and Saul had those individuals killed because they were conspiring against him. Can you imagine living a life like that? Can you imagine imagine trying to understand what God's will for your life would be in a situation like that? God, I don't understand What's happening? It doesn't make any sense to me. Here I am trying to do your will, to obey you the best I know how to. But Lord, all I get is the person that I've seen on this world, the, the, the man that I seek to serve the best, is out to kill me. Even turn my best friend against me. You see, Saul probably would have hoped that Uh, that his son would have taken over the throne after him. Saul knew that David had been anointed king. He knew that the kingdom had been torn away from him. But neither Saul nor David knew when that was going to happen. And David reaches the point. Now we come down to this particular story. And there's a statement made in the scripture. I'm going to go back to that first, and then I'm going to actually share three specific things from this that I believe occurred that, that illustrate the kind of transformation I want to share with you today. If I go back into the scripture, he, he the, the, in verse 6, he, he became, or verse 5, he was upset because he, he cut the robe, robe of King Saul. And he said, the Lord knows I shouldn't have done that to my Lord the King. He said to his men, the Lord forbid that I should do this to my Lord the King and attack the Lord's anointed one. For the Lord himself has chosen him. 
Some, one man put it this way. David felt that he should not try to replace what God has put in place. That it was not his place to remove someone from a position that God had placed there, even though he was now next in line. Until God did it in his heart and in his mind, he wasn't going to do anything. Now, now picture the, circ the situation. Most, some of you already know this story, and you can look at it and kind of laugh. I mean, you know, he, he, King Saul went into this cave to relieve himself. He needed a potty break, okay? They didn't have rest areas along the highways like we have. But he went, and that's what he was doing. And here's David and his soldiers in this cave back in there, hiding in the shadows. That would have been a very uncomfortable situation. But in doing so, David began to listen a little bit to his other friends, and he reached out and he cut a portion of the robe off. Saul finished his business, he will, left the cave. David later came out, and after Saul got a little ways away, David basically announced himself and basically told Saul what he did and what he didn't do. Now here's what I want to illustrate. Three basic things from this particular scripture that I believe and I will bring to a close of how this is a different type of transformation. I want you to see the first one. And that is when we find that David found himself in a place not of his choosing. Oftentimes in life we find ourselves in places that we didn't choose to be there. We didn't choose to be in this particular relationship with someone. We didn't choose to be in this particular business with someone. We didn't choose to be in this particular circumstance. But that's where we find ourselves. Now what do we do? David found himself in a place not of his own choosing. He would much rather have been back in the king's court, playing the harp, eating the good food, having a good time with Jonathan, laughing with the king, whatever the case may be. But David found himself on the lamb. He was running, he was hiding, and he found himself hiding in this cave. And sometimes we too find ourselves in places not of our own choosing. We have to make a decision how we're going to handle that, okay? We're in this situation, you're in a situation, maybe you're in one right now. I don't know who it with, is with, I don't know what the circumstance may be. But oftentimes we find ourselves there and we ask God the very same question that I believe maybe David may have been at least thinking at some point. Why me? Why here? Why now? Why him? Why not this other way? God, I don't understand. But even in David's, I believe, not understanding, David remained faithful, believing that it was not his place to remove from his place what God had put in place. Sometimes that's also true of us, that it's not our responsibility to necessarily bring something about that God has already put in place. It's not necessarily our responsibility to make things different, but it's our responsibility to remain still and wait on God. When God chooses to make it different, that, that and then will probably be our time and our place to make our move. Secondly, he found himself in a compromising position. Visualize, if you will, David in the cave, the king having to relieve himself. David found himself in the shadows. He was in a compromising position. And maybe we too find ourselves in compromising positions sometimes. This is a place I don't want to be. This is a position I don't want to be in. How do I get myself out of it? David didn't necessarily try to remove himself from the circumstance, but he remained quiet. Yes, he cut off a piece of the robe. But he didn't necessarily do what his friends were trying to tell him to do. Is basically, he could have arrested Saul. He could have taken him into captivity himself. He could have brought him before the city and said, look, okay, I'm taking over the throne now. This is, I'm tired of this, this running. He found himself in a compromising position. He had to remain quiet and in the shadows and basically do nothing. 
And sometimes you may find yourself in a circumstance that is not, not where you want to be, but you may have to remain quiet. And you may have to wait. Because the time just is not right yet for you to act. Now the third thing that he had to do basically was this. is He had some very, very critical decisions to make. And so do you today. You see, every time I open God's word, I have a decision to make. Am I going to try to let God speak to me? Or am I just going to read it and say, I've done my devotional for the day? Am I not going to sit and think about what God has said? I have a decision to make. And I, as I woke up this morning, I had a decision to make. Am I going to let God have control of my day or not? Am I going to let have God control of my thoughts, my words, my feelings, my actions? Each and every moment that I live today, I have to make those basic decisions. Who's going to be in charge? Who am I going to let be in charge? I said I gave my life to Christ. He died for me, paid a price I couldn't pay. I gave myself up to him, asked him to come in to be my, not just my savior, but my Lord. Am I going to let him be my Lord? Is he going to have the right to basically tell me how to live my life, where to go, so on and so on? David had some decisions to make. First of all, who was he going to listen to? Was he going to listen to his friends? Remember, his friends encouraged him. The time is ripe. You couldn't ask for a better opportunity. You know, sometimes opportunities come our way, and we've been praying for God to show us his will. And sometimes we think when certain opportunities present themselves that God did that. Just because a door may open doesn't mean God opened it. There's an enemy out there seeking to mess up God's plan too and to do it through you. Remember the enemy's conversation with Jesus in the wilderness. And I guarantee you, he knows scripture better than you and I do. And he quoted scripture to Jesus to try to get Jesus to break the scripture. But it sounded so good, we may not even see the twist in it. Jesus had a decision to make, just like David did. Who was Jesus going to listen to, and who was David going to listen to? It's a hard thing, I know. Because when I've been praying for so long and agonizing and hurting and wondering and frustrated, and all of a sudden, wow, this must be God's answer. Maybe it wasn't. Sometimes I've acted on those, only to come away with later on, no, that was not God. That was me. That was not God. I didn't wait long enough. I didn't listen hard enough. I don't know. He had to decide who he was going to listen to, and that's a decision that you have to make as well in your daily life. That's a decision you have to make today even. Who are you going to listen to today? If the Spirit of God is working on your heart, trying to tell you you need to do something, you have a decision to make. Am I going to listen to that movement of the Spirit, or am I going to listen to my old self saying, not now, not yet, it's not time, i got plenty of time. I just have to understand more of it. One real quick piece of advice is this. If you, ha if you have to wait to have all your questions answered before you make a decision, you'll never make a decision. Because you'll always come up with another question. And the enemy will be right there with his bag of tricks. Here's another one. Here's another one. Here's another one. I've learned somewhere along the line, sometimes it's in the obedience comes the knowledge. Sometimes God asks me, you just be obedient, and then I'll let you know what it is you're asking, ultimately. He had the decision to make, should he inform Saul of the fact that he was there and what he did? Well, he decided to do that very thing. But he decided to do it at a safe distance. He didn't just suddenly just jump up and say, hey, Saul, look. Poor Saul. But he had to make a decision as to when he was going to let Saul know about the position he had found himself in. And then he had to tell Saul, and this is another decision we're looking at possibly, this is how I came to my decision. It wasn't because someone else encouraged me to. It wasn't just because I wanted to. It was because, in a sense, I believe you're God's anointed. And, and I'm, you know, when God does what he does, that's, what, that's only when I'll wait. And I don't understand all of this. When we think of transformation, we think of this idea, like I said, the caterpillar 
going from the caterpillar to the butterfly. But this is an unlikely transformation, and this transformation is this. This is someone taking a stand to do exactly what God says. Not making it different than what God says. Saul did that too. Saul did that too. With Samuel the prophet, the Sam Samuel was supposed to come and give a blessing on, on the army and whatever, and the sacrifices before they went out to war. Well, Saul got impatient with Samuel because Samuel didn't show up when he thought he should show up. So Saul decided he'd make the sacrifices himself. Samuel wasn't happy with that. Or when they went out and they captured the individuals and they were given the command, and this is a hard one to understand, they were supposed to kill or run, over, run out everyone and everything that had lived in that, that country before. And Saul went out and he killed, he killed some and then he kept some, took them back to the camp. But then when, when Saul was confronted, Saul tried to basically worm, worm his way out of it. Well, I was going to burn them as sacrifices to God anyway. That wasn't what he was told to do. Decisions. Sometimes the hardest transformation is to not necessarily become what someone else may think we ought to become or become what maybe what we think we ought to become, but sometimes it's remaining firm in the Word of God. Now, David would have a problem with this later on in his life. David know, knew what God had to say about certain things, and we see David doing a lot of things he shouldn't have been doing. But at least up until this point, David became an individual. He said he was going to wait on God, and that's exactly what he did. He waited until he was sure it was God, not what someone else thought might be God, what maybe circumstances may think we, may we think it's God, but when he knew for absolute sure. When God removed Saul from his place, that's when David took his place, not before transformation that is very, very unlikely is sometimes no transformation but remaining firm. I don't know where you're at in your life today. I don't know what decisions you need to make. I don't know what your home life is like, your work life is like. I don't know what your friendships are like. I don't know what your school is like. I don't know any of that. But you want to know something? You do and God does. And God has a plan and I know you want to know God's will. So let's go to God right now and ask him to reveal to you what you need to do, whatever it might be. And when we're finished with that prayer, then the musicians are going to come and we're going to take up an offering. And we're going to worship through that time too. And we're going to have a prayer before we do that. But if there's something you need to decide today, let's take these next few moments to give you that opportunity. Father, Sometimes the hardest thing to do is simply to stand firm. To know and to do what we know to do. Not what we think we ought to do, but what you've already shown us to do. What you've been faithful in, in, in doing for us and with us and through us. Father, sometimes the most unlikely change is to remain firm. It's hard. Because sometimes we want things different. Dif David knew he was to become king, but he didn't know when. And I'm sure it frustrated him, and, and he caused lots of questions. And Father, there are things that we believe that we know you want for us too. But Father, sometimes the waiting causes us confusion and frustration and bewilderment. Your word promises, that it tells us not to worry. You will prepare things for us. You will give us things we absolutely need. So, Father, if there's someone here today who has a decision to make, whatever that decision might be, accepting you as Lord and Savior, following you in believer's baptism, uniting with this church as a member of this church, going to someone else and righting a wrong, getting the process started, whatever it might be, I thank you, Father, that today we have that opportunity. In Jesus' name. Amen.